So welcome everyone uh, to, to this lecture on graph convolutional uh, networks. Um, okay, so this is the outline of the lecture. So first I will go quickly um, on the traditional uh, convnets, uh, the architecture. And then I will introduce graphs and I will also um, remind uh, definitions of convolutions to extend it to, to graphs. Then I will present uh, two classes of graph uh, convnets. Uh, the first one is what I call a spectral graph convnets and the second one is the spatial graph convnets. I will talk a little bit about uh, benchmarking graph neural networks and finally I will conclude. Okay, so let's start with the traditional convnets. Um, so we all know convnets um, are a breakthrough in, in computer vision. So when uh, for the ImageNet competition, you know, for the image classification task, um, when convnet was used, um, they decreased by almost a factor two the error um, of classification. It was in 2012, and it was basically the end of uh, uncrafting uh, features, and we shift uh, the paradigm to uncrafting learning systems. And now for this very sp specific task, we all know that we, we, we go to uh, superhuman performance. Uh, Covenets are also um, a breakthrough in speech and natural language processing. So at Facebook, when you want to translate, you are also using uh, Covenets. So convnets are powerful um, architectures um, to actually solve high dimensional uh, learning problems. So we all know about the curse of dimensionality. So if you have an image, let's say 1,000 uh, by 1,000 pixels, so it's, um, you have 1 million variables, so an image can be seen as a point in a space of 1 million dimensions. And for each dimension, if you sample uh, by, using, um, by using 10 samples, then you have uh, 10 to the power 1 million uh, possible images. So these spaces are really huge. And of course, this is the question, how do you find the needle of information in this big uh, haystack? So covenants are really powerful to extract uh, basically this, this information, the, the best possible representation of your, of your image data to, uh, to solve problems. Uh, of course, we don't know yet everything about um, yeah, we don't know yet everything about uh, convnets, so it's a kind of, of a miracle how, um, how powerful, how, how good they are. And it's also quite exciting because uh, uh, this opened many uh, research areas to understand better and to develop new architectures. Okay, so when you use convnets, you are doing an assumption. And the main assumption that you are using is that your data, so images, videos, speech, is compositional. It means that it is form of patterns that are uh, local. Uh, so you know this is uh, the contribution of urban and visual. So if you are at this layer for this neuron, this neuron is going to be connected to a few neurons in the previous layer and not all neurons. Okay, so this is the local reception field um, assumption. Then you have also the property of stationary, stationarity. So basically you have some patterns and that are similar and that are uh, shared across your image domain. Okay, so like the yellow, uh, the yellow patches and the blue patches, so they are, they are all similar to each other. The last property is hierarchical. So you make the assumption that your uh, data is hierarchical in the sense that uh, your low level features are going to be combined together to form a medium level uh, features and then these medium features are going to be again combined uh, to each other to form um, higher and higher abstract uh, features. So, um, so any convnet work the same way. So the first part of the architecture is to extract these convolutional uh, features, and then the second part will be to solve your specific task. Uh, you know, like uh, classification, recommendation. Uh, and so on. And this is what we call, you know, end-to-end -end systems. And the first part is to learn the features. The second part is to solve your task. Okay. Um, okay, let's see more precisely what is the data domain. So if you have images, volumes, or videos, basically, so for example, you, you can see this image. And if you zoom in this image, what you have is a 2D grid. Okay, you have a 2D grid. This is the structure of, um, of the domain of this image. And on the top of, the, of this grid, you have some features. 
So for example, in the case of uh, color image, we will have uh, three features, which are red, green, and blue. Okay. Now, if I'm looking at um, uh, natural language processing, so like sentences, uh, you will have a sequence of words. And basically, you can see that, you know, as a 1D grid. And on the top of this grid, for each node of the grid, you will have uh, a word. Okay, so a word can be represented by just uh, an integer, for example. The same also for speech. So what you see here is um, the variation of the air pressure, and it's the same. You know, it's like uh, you have uh, the support is a 1D grid, and each, for each node uh, of the grid, you will have uh, the, the air pressure value, okay, which is, which is a real number. So uh, I think it's clear. Uh, we, all, we all use all the time grids, and grids as uh, you know as very strong regular spatial structure. And for this for this um, for this structure, um, this is good because we mathematically we can define uh, the convenient operations like convolution and pooling. And also in practice, it's very fast to do it. So everything everything is good. Now let's look at you know um, new uh, new data. So for example, social networks, okay? So you want, you want to do your task, for example, it would be to do advertisement or to, or to also make recommendation. So for a social network, I'm going to, it's going to be clear, but I'm going to show you that if you take two nodes, so for example, uh, you know you have this user, uh, let's say this is user I and user J, and all the others, you see that this is not a grid, okay? So the connection, the pairwise connection between all users they do not form a grid. They have a very special uh, pattern of connections. And this is basically a graph, OK? So uh, how do you define your graph? You're going to see the connection between users. So if I, user I and user J are friends, you're going to have your know, connection. And then for this, you are going to use what we call an adjacency matrix, which is just going to uh, record all the connection or non-connection um, between nodes uh, in, your, in your social networks. Okay. And on the top of your network, uh, for each user, you will have features. So for example, you have, you know, messages, you have images, you have videos. So they form, you know, some feature in a d-dimensional space. Uh, in, um, in neuroscience, um, uh, in brain analysis, for example, we are really interesting to understand, uh, you know, the fundamental relation, re relationship between um, structure and function of the brain. So they are really um, connect, uh, related to each other, and it's very fundamental to understand that. We also want, for example, to predict uh, neurodegenerative disease, different stages of this disease. So then this is very important. Um, for this, we need to understand the brain. And the brain, if you look at the brain, the brain is uh, composed of what we call region of interest, okay? And this region of interest, if you take one region of interest, this region is not connected to all other regions in the brain. Actually, they are only connected to a few other regions. So it's, it's and again, you can see nothing to do with the grid. Okay, so this special connection uh, between different regions of the brains, they can be measured by the structural MRI uh, signal. And then you also have an adjacency matrix um, between region I and region J. And, and here you have a strength of connection, which depends how many uh, connection, how many fibers do you have to connect region I and region J, okay? Um, and then on the top of this graph, so if you look at the region I, then you will have activations, you know, functional uh, um, activation, which is basically a time series that you can see here. And also we can record this activation of the brain with a functional MRI, okay? The last uh, example I want to show you is in quantum chemistry. So for example, the task would be to design uh, new molecules for drugs and, and materials. So, so you see again, uh, the connection between atoms has nothing to do with the grid, okay? Uh, it really depends um, how you're going to connect uh, your atoms, and then you will have, you know, uh, molecules. So, uh, so the connection between atoms, they are called bond. Um, and you have, you know, different kind of bonds. They can be uh, single bond, double bond, aromatic bond, and you have, and you have also different uh, features like energy uh, and many other features that you can use uh, from, from chemistry. Um, for, for the node of the graph, so there are atoms, and again, you, you, you may have uh, different features like the type of atom, 
if it is you know um, hydrogen, if it is azote, all, all these all these types. You have also the 3D coordinates. You have the charge and so on. You may have multiple uh, features. Okay, so um, and it's not uh, the list actually uh, goes on uh, to give you example of uh, graph uh, graph domains. Uh, so you also have, you know, computer graphics uh, with 3D meshes. Uh, you also want maybe to analyze uh, transportation, uh, network, and the density of, uh, of cars, or maybe, I don't know, trains. Uh, you have also, you know, gene regulatory network. You have knowledge graphs, um, world relationships, uh, you know, users, products, uh, where you want to do recommendation. You have also sin understanding. You want to give more common sense to your computer vision machine. So you want to understand the relationship between, between your objects. You also uh, have, you know, for example, if you want to detect uh, high energy physics uh, particles, so you have captors and the captors are not, you know, structured as a regular grid. So for all this, you see that there is a, a de denominator uh, which is basically you can represent um, all these um, problems as graphs, okay? And, and here is the common setting. I, I would say the mathematical common setting for all these uh, problems. Um, so the graphs, uh, let's, let's call it uh, G, okay? They are defined by three uh, entities. So the first entity is going to be the set of vertices. So usually you are going to index the set of vertices from one to n. n is, is the number of nodes in your, in your graph, okay? So for example, this would be the index one, two, three, uh, and so on. Then you will have, you know, the set of edges. Basically, they are the connections between, um, between the nodes. And finally, you will have the adjacency matrix A, which will give you the strengths of the connection um, of your of your edge, okay. Um, okay. Then you have graph features. So, uh, for example, for each node, the node I or node J, you will have some um, some node features. So it's basically a vector of dimensionality dv. Okay. The same also. It's it's possible that you can get um, uh, you can get edge features, uh, and it's going to be a vector of dimensionality DE. Uh, so for example, for molecules, um, the node feature may be, you know, the atom type and the edge feature may be the bond type to give you an example. And finally, you can have also some graph feature, okay? For all, for the whole graph, you can have some feature. So again, it's, um, uh, it's a vector of dimensionality DG. And, and in the case of, of, uh, of chemistry, that, that, that may be the molecule energy. Okay, so this is, um, I would say, the general definition of, of graphs. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is that I'm going to talk about convolution and the question, how do we extend convolution to graphs? Okay, so first let me remind you um, the classical way to use convolutional layer uh, for grids when we use uh, ConvNets for computer vision. So let's say um, I have this image and, uh, or maybe this is some, uh, you know, um, hidden uh, feature at layer L, okay? And I'm going to do the convolution with uh, some pattern or kernel um, that of course I will learn by back propagation. And then I will get some activation, okay? So this is the, um, the features at the next layer. So to give you maybe some dimensionality, so for example, N1 and 2 is gonna be the number of pixels in the X and Y direction, and D is the dimensionality of, uh, of each pixel. So if this is a color image, the dimensionality is gonna be three for the three colors. And if this is like intermediate uh, hidden feature, maybe you will have 100 you know, dimensions. For the kernel, uh, usually you take small kernels because you want you know, the uh, local reception field, so that might be, you know, three by three pixels uh, kernel or five by five, five, five by five. And of course you have D because you need to, uh, to respect the dimensionality of your input, uh, of your input features. Okay, so maybe for this one, so you see that, uh, so you are going to convert this image with this feature, which is oriented in this direction. So you will uh, basically uh, identify 
uh, you know, uh, lines in, in, in this direction of the image. So that was just an example. And we use padding right, right now, right? So we had the same dimensionality of the... Uh, yes, it, yes, absolutely, you can use padding. So you basically, you don't reduce the size of your image, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay, so, so how do we mathematically define convolution? So the first uh, definition is to do, is to see convolution as a template matching, okay? So, so template matching, uh, so here is the definition, the mathematical definition of uh, convolution. So what you're gonna do is that you're going to take your template, you're going to take your image, and then you are going to uh, sum over um, the index in the whole uh, image domain, uh, omega, okay, of wj, and this is going to be um, a product between vector wj and vector hi minus j. Okay, so this is the pure definition of convolution. And when, uh, what we do usually in, uh, in computer vision is that we don't take minus, we, we take plus. Okay, uh, and we call that because, because when, we, when we do that, we have the definition of correlation. And this is, this is you know, because it's more uh, like, it, it's, it's exactly like template matching. Okay, so it doesn't change anything if you, if you do i minus j or i plus j in the learning sense, because the only thing that you do is that you flip up and down and left and right your, uh, your, 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 your kernel. And when you learn, you, it doesn't change anything, basically. Okay. But this is the definition of correlation. So it's, it's really a template matching. And then I'm going to take for the notation uh, ij. Okay. So basically, and yeah, and something very important that you have here is that you when, when we do um, convolutional layers, we are using um, kernel with compact support, you know, like a tree by tree. It's very small uh, support. When we do that, we don't do the sum over the whole domain, the whole image domain. We just do the sum over the neighborhood of uh, the node i, okay? And this is very important. It's very important because suddenly the sum is not over the whole pixel. It's just, you know, um, in the neighborhood. And then the complexity of doing convolution is actually um, to the order of the number of nodes, so the number of pixels in your, in your image. So, so the, the complexity is quite easy to, to compute. So what you're going to do is that you're going to take your, uh, your pattern, you're going to slice your pattern. So it's going to be n uh, slicing because n number of locations. And then you're going to do, you know, a scalar product of three by three elements and, and you're gonna do, you know, um, um, pro, uh, uh, vector, uh, product of vectors of dimensionality D. So you see the complexity of doing this operation is just N times three times three times D. So the complexity is N. And, and again, everything can be done in parallel if you have a GPU. The computation that you are doing in this, in this location is independent to, to the computation that you're doing in this location. So everything is, 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 is linear complexity. Okay, so doing that, uh, okay, so so at the end of the day, if you want to do convolution with template matching, you're just going to compute this um, scalar product between your template and between uh, your uh, your image. Um, I would say your image patch. Okay. Um, okay. So something that is very important uh, to see in the case of um, the graph being uh, grid. So this is for standard convolution in computer vision. If you look at, if you are looking at, you know, your template, which is here, okay? So you see that I'm going to give some node ordering, uh, J1, J2, J3, and so on to J9. And this node ordering is actually very important, okay? Because for, for all time, I mean, this node, I mean, this, this node, so for example, the node J3 will always be positioned at the same location. So it's always gonna be at the top right corner of, of the pattern, okay? So that's, that's very important. Why it's very important? So let me go to the next slide. So why it's very important is, so when I will do the convolution, so the pattern matching, again, I will take my, uh, my pattern and I will slice the pattern over my image domain, okay? So that will be maybe here and I put it here. And, and, and also this is position I, position I prime that I put here. So when I'm going to do the template matching between the kernel and the image, what I will do is that for this index, so the index uh, G3, it will always match, you know, the information in the image 
at, at this uh, index here, okay? So this is very important. So you, when you have a grid, the node ordering, the node positioning is always the same, whatever the position in your image. So when you do the template matching between index J3 and this index here in the image, you always compare the same information. You always compare the feature uh, at the top right corner uh, of your pattern and the type rock corner of the image patch, okay? So this, um, this uh, you see these matching scores, they are for the same information, okay? So that's very important. So now let's look at what happened for graphs. Okay, so the question is, can we extend this definition of template matching for graphs? And there are two main issues. So the first issue is basically on a graph, you don't have any uh, ordering of your nodes. Okay, so on the graph, you, you have no given position uh, for your nodes. So let's say, for example, I have this uh, graph template. Okay, so there are like four nodes with this connection and I have this uh, vertex here. The thing is, for this vertex, I know nothing about the position. The only thing that I know is the index. Okay, so maybe this is the index number three for this one. And then when, when, if I want to use the template matching definition, what I'm gonna do is that I need to match, you know, this uh, index with other index uh, in the graph domain. So this is my graph and let's say this is for the node i and they are the neighbors of the node i. So for this neighbor, this is the index, the same index J3. But here, I mean, how can I match, you know, this information with this information when I do not know if they match to each, they match with, to each other? Because on the graph, you don't have any ordering of your nodes. You don't know uh, if this nodes it's for the top right corner uh, of, of any information. You don't know that. So on the graph, you have no notion of where, where is the up, where is the down, where is the right, where is the left, okay? So when you do this matching, between uh, this feature uh, vector and this feature vector, actually this matching usually in general has no meaning, okay? You, you, you don't know what you compare to each other, okay? And again, the index uh, is completely arbitrary, okay? So you can have the value three here, but it can be here the value number two or, or value number 12. You, you don't have, this is, this is not, uh, you know, any uh, good information. So basically, because you don't have any uh, ordering of your nodes on graphs, you cannot use uh, the definition of template matching. You cannot use that directly. So we, we will need to do something else. Okay, the second issue with template matching for graphs is what happens if um, the number of nodes in your template does not match the number of nodes, you know, uh, in your in your graph. So for example, here I have four nodes. Here I have four nodes, fine. Um, maybe I can find a way to compare um, the, two inf the two sets of, of nodes. But here I have, uh, I have seven nodes. So how I'm going to compare seven nodes to four nodes? So that's also, you know, an open issue. Okay, so the third mathematical definition was to use template matching to define convolution. Now the second definition is to use the convolution, the convolution theorem. So the convolution theorem from, um, from Fourier is basically the Fourier transform of the convolution of two functions is the pointwise product of their Fourier transform. This is what you see here, okay? So the Fourier transform of uh, the convolution of uh, function W and function H is the Fourier transform of F and pointwise multiplication, the Fourier transform of H. Then if you do the inverse Fourier transform, you go back to your, um, to your convolution. So nice, okay, we have a very um, nice formula to do the convolution of W and H. And, but the thing is, in a general case, doing the Fourier transform is N square complexity. We come back to that. However, if, you, if your domain, uh, like, uh, like the image grid, has some very particular structure, then you can reduce the complexity to N log N uh, by using, you know, uh, fast Fourier transform. Okay, so the question is, can we extend this definition of, uh, of convolution uh, theorem to graphs? So the question is, how do we redefine uh, Fourier transform for, for graphs? Okay, and, and 
and the thing is how to make it fast. Okay, so remember that in the case of uh, of template matching, uh, the, we have linear complexity. So how do we have a fast spectral convolution in linear time uh, for compact kernels? So that's that's the two open question. Okay, so basically we are going to use these two definitions of convolution to uh, design two classes of graph neural network. So the, um, this would be the template machine would be for the spatial uh, graph complex, and the convolutional theorem I'm going to use that for the spectral graph complex. And this is the next uh, the next part that I'm going to talk about now. Okay. So let's talk about uh, how we do spectral convolution. Okay. So. I, I, there is a book that I like very much, uh, which is the book of uh, Fan Chang, which is uh, Spectral Graph Theory. So there is everything nice, like uh, harmonic analysis, graph theory, combinatorial problems, and optimization. So I really recommend uh, you know people to read the books if they, if they want to know uh, more and uh, a lot more about, about this, these questions. So how do we perform spectral convolution? So we are going to use four steps. So the first step will be to do will be to define graph Laplacian. Second step will be to define Fourier functions. Then we will do Fourier transform and eventually uh, convolution theorem. Okay. So the, what is the graph Laplacian? So the graph Laplacian. This is the core operator in spectral graph theory. Okay. So remember how we define a graph. We have a set of vertices, a set of edges. And then we have the adjacency matrix. So is the graph has n vertices, the adjacency matrix is a n by n uh, matrix. So we are going simply to define the Laplacian, which is also going to be a n by n matrix, to be the identity minus the adjacency matrix. And we are going to normalize the adjacency matrix by using um, the degree of each node. So D is basically a diagonal matrix. And the diagonal, each element of the diagonal is basically the degree of the node, okay? So we are doing, and this is called the normalized Laplacian, okay? So this is, I would say this is by default, the definition of uh, Laplacian that we use for, for graphs. So we can interpret uh, this, uh, this operator. So the Laplacian can is- I ask one question. So yes. the, the A was that matrix with uh, basically all the zeros, and the one was representing the connection between uh, edges, right? Um, yes. So uh, for Facebook, for example, I would say that this is exactly the definition. So if uh, node i, user i, is a friend with uh, user j, then you will have uh, adjacency matrix value will be i, i, j equal to 1. And if uh, two users are not friends, then you will get the value 0. But sometimes you have a real value for A. For example, for the, uh, for the brain connectivity graph, um, the value of AIJ is um, the degree of connection between the two regions. So basically mm -hmm. what we say, the number of fibers that connect uh, region I and region J. So that can be binary, that can be also a continuous value. And also this is symmetric if it's non-oriented graph, otherwise yeah. it's... Yeah. So yeah, for, um, usually it is symmetric. Uh, and you want you want the symmetry for for mathematical reasons, mm -hmm. um, but you may have some not. So here, this is the normalized Laplacian. But if you have the random walk Laplacian, uh, then this is non-symmetric. Okay, so it's um, it's it's different definition of the Laplacian. So in the case of Laplacian, it's very interesting. So in the continuous setting, you have only one definition for the Laplacian. This is called the Laplace Beltrami operator. In the discrete setting you have multiple definitions. You can do your own definition of the Laplacian depending on, on the assumptions that, that you are going to use. Mm -hmm. I understand, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so we can interpret the Laplacian. So the Laplacian is nothing else than a measure of smoothness of um, a function on a, on a graph. So this is nothing else than, you, you, see, you see, so I'm doing the Laplacian that I apply to a function h, okay, on a graph, and I'm looking at what happened at the vertex i. And if I expand this definition, I will have the value of hi minus the mean value of the neighborhood. Okay. So basically, if your signal is smooth, you know, if it doesn't vary much, then this difference will be very small. 
But if your signal, you know, varies a lot, it oscillates a lot, then the difference will be very high. So the Laplacian is nothing else than a measure of smoothness of function on a, on a, on a graph. Okay. All right, so um, now let's define Fourier functions. So let's, let's take the Laplacian uh, matrix and let's do a little bit of linear algebra. Let's do eigen decomposition of the graph Laplacian. So when you do eigen decomposition, you will have the, you, you are going to factorize your Laplacian matrix into three matrices. So you have a phi transpose, lambda, and phi. So this matrix, phi, of the size n by n, actually uh, have, the, what, have the Laplacian eigenvectors, okay, for each column. And the Laplacian eigenvectors, they are called the Fourier functions, okay, the famous Fourier functions. And uh, of course, this is an orthonormal basis. Um, so when you do the, the product between two bases, you will get one uh, if they are the same, and then you get zero if they are uh, orthogonal, if they are different. Uh, you, this is also an invertible um, ma matrix. This guy, so this matrix, this is the uh, a diagonal matrix of the Laplacian eigenvalues. So lambda one to lambda n. And, and, and we know that for the normalized Laplacian that these values are bounded between zero and between two. So this is the maximum value that you can get. This guy, the Laplacian eigenvalues, they are known as the spectrum of the graph. Okay, so if you take a graph, here you have a 27 nodes. If I compute the uh, Laplacian eigenvalues and if I plot them, I have uh, a signature of the graph, which is called the spectrum of the graph. Okay, that which will be different for each each graph, okay? And here you have, okay, th this is what I say. So this is uh, doing, um, again, the composition. So if you take your uh, Laplacian matrix and you apply to a vector uh, phi of k, then you will get the eigenvalue, lambda k, times the same vector uh, phi of k, okay? So this is the definition of the um, eigen decomposition. Okay, so you see that Fourier functions, they are nothing else than the Laplacian uh, eigenvectors. Okay, let me illustrate uh, these uh, Fourier functions. So we actually, we already know uh, Fourier functions. Uh, if, you, if you take the grid, so for example, you take here a Wendy grid and you compute the Fourier functions. So you, so you will get uh, phi zero, okay? Then you will get phi one, which is this one, which is smooth phi two, which is less, a little less smooth, and phi three, and so on and so on. So this is well known, this is the cosine function and the sinusoids. And we use that, you know, for, uh, for image compression. So if we take an image and we project the image on the Fourier functions, then the image is gonna be, the, the, the transformation is gonna be sparse. So you only keep, you know, the highest coefficient and you can do compression. So this is something that we've used for a very uh, long time. For, for graph, for the graph domain, this is, this is quite interesting. So you see that uh, this is a graph and I'm computing here the, the first uh, four, uh, you know, Fourier function of the graphs. So you see for phi one, uh, you still have oscillations, you know, between positive and negative value, the same between positive and negative value and, and, and here as well. Um, what is interesting is that this oscillation uh, depends on the topology of the graph. Okay, so, so it's related to the, to the geometry of the graph, like communities, like hubs, and so on. And we know that, uh, so for example, if you want to capture k communities on graph, uh, a very good algorithm is to apply k-means on the first k uh, Fourier functions. If you do that, you have something that we call spectrograph theory. And it's, it's, a, it's a huge literature. Uh, and, and if you want to know more about this, there is this very nice tutorial by Van Lomsburg about, about uh, spectrograph uh, clustering and using all these notions of Fourier functions. Okay. Okay, now let me introduce you a Fourier transform. Okay, so for this, I'm going to uh, do the Fourier series. Fourier series is, is nothing else than you take a function H defined on your graph and then you are going to decompose this function using the Fourier function, okay? So I take my function h, I project my function h 
uh, on each uh, Fourier function, uh, phi of k. And I will get, you know, uh, this coefficient of this Fourier series, it's going to be a scalar, multiplied by my function phi of k, okay, of the type n, n by 1, of the size n, n, n by 1, okay? So, and doing that, you know, just projecting my function on the Fourier functions give me the Fourier transform, okay? So the Fourier transform is, is just, you know, the coefficient of the Fourier series, nothing else. Okay, then H, you know, is a, um, basically a linear combination of the Fourier transform times the, um, the Fourier functions, okay? I can rewrite everything um, in matrix uh, vector uh, representation. And this guy, so doing the um, phi times uh, the, the Fourier transform, this is actually the inverse Fourier transform, okay? So let me uh, summarize this. If I do, if I project H on the Fourier uh, functions, I will have the Fourier transform, okay? So I'm, I'm taking the matrix of the Fourier uh, functions and I multiply by H. So this is N by N by N, this is N by one, so this is N by one, okay? Uh, and now, if I do uh, inverse Fourier transform of uh, the Fourier transform, okay? So I, I will have phi of um, Fourier transform of H and this guy is here, okay? So I just put uh, phi transpose H, and we know that um, the, the basis is orthonormal, so this guy is actually identity function. The identity, I'm sorry, identity matrix, okay? So this identity matrix, so I come back to, to H. So, so the inverse Fourier transform is, is uh, of, of the Fourier transform is H, uh, obviously, okay? So one thing that you can observe is that the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform can be done in one line of code, okay? You just take your vector h, you multiply by this matrix, and that's it. And the same also to do the inverse Fourier transform, you take your, your signal and you multiply by this matrix. So it's basically just linear operations, uh, just multiplying a matrix by a vector. And this is how you do Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform on graphs. Okay, now let's, Let's do the convolution theorem. So again, the convolution theorem, the Fourier transform, the Fourier transform of your, um, the Fourier transform of the convolution is, is gonna be the pointwise product of the Fourier transform of each signal, okay? So let's say I have um, W convolution H. Uh, so I'm going first to do the Fourier transform of W. Then this is gonna be a vector of the size N by one then I'm going to multiply pointwise by another vector, which is the Fourier transform of H, okay? So how do we get the Fourier transform? It's just by doing uh, phi transpose W and phi transpose H. And then I'm going to do the inverse Fourier transform to, to, come, to go back to the spatial domain. So I just multiply by the matrix phi, okay? And by N. So this is what I write here, okay? I have phi, I have um, W hat, which is a Fourier transform, and I have this. This, I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it to this line. What is this line? Um, shouldn't there be a phi transpose before W hat? Sorry? Shouldn't there be a phi transpose before W hat? No, the inverse Fourier transform is phi. Okay. So you do phi and you multiply by the Fourier transform, which is a phi transpose W, which I call uh, hat uh, W. So I'm going, I'm going to use that a lot. Uh, I will come back to this. And then here you have the Fourier transform of H, which is just phi transpose H, which is here. Okay. So this guy, um, okay, this guy is actually what we call the spectral function. Okay, the spectral filter. So this guy is a vector of n by one. Okay, and I'm writing, I'm writing here, uh, th this vector here. So you see, this is a vector of uh, n elements. And this is actually the spectral function, which is um, evaluated at the, at, the, uh, at the eigenvalue lambda one, which is here. So this is this point here. Then you have uh, W uh, hat lambda two, which is this, this value here and so on and so on, okay? And then I'm going to rewrite this, you know, I'm going to put this uh, in a diagonal, okay? So I will do diagonal of this vector so this will create a matrix of the size n by n, okay? And I'm putting this guy back here. So I'm going to change the, 
the pointwise multiplication of this vector n by one and this vector n by one by the matrix vector multiplication. And it's going to be the same, right? Uh, this is a diagonal matrix, which contains this guy, multiply, multiply by, this, by this vector. So this, it's exactly the same, these two lines. But what I want to do that, because I want to get rid of the parentheses. Okay, so I don't have the parentheses anymore. And I have just, you know, matrix, matrix multiplication. Okay, so this is, this is what I get. <clears throat> um, then when I'm, I'm going to do something is that we know that when you apply a function on the eigenvalues, okay, if you have some orthogonal basis, then you can put it inside. You can put it inside. And this is what I do here. I put uh, phi and phi transpose inside. And this guy is precisely the definition of the Laplacian. Okay, the Laplacian, uh, when I do the eigen decomposition, is phi lambda phi transpose. Okay. Um, then, so what I have is basically the spectral function that I applied to the Laplacian uh, uh, operator. And this is n by n uh, matrix and applied to the vector n by one. So at the end, I would get uh, n by one uh, vector, okay? So you see that if you want to do, so it's, it's important now. So it, if you want to do a convolution of two functions on graph W and H, what you're going to do is that uh, you're going to take the spectral function of W, you will apply it to the, uh, to the Laplacian, and then you multiply by H, okay? This is the definition of, uh, of spectral convolution, okay? And, and the thing is, this is very expensive uh, in practice to do it. Why it is expensive? It's because the matrix phi is a full matrix, okay? It contains uh, the n, uh, the n um, Fourier functions, and they are not zero, okay? So it's a dense matrix, and you are going to pay the price of n square. And you don't have any FFT, because the thing, you don't have any FFT for, uh, for general graph, okay? So this is a, this, this is a lot. And, and why it is a lot? Because n, remember, n, this is the number of nodes in your domain. So if you have, um, if you have a big graph, for example, if you have uh, the web, the web has, you know, billions of nodes. n is equal to the billions. So you need to do billions square, which is going to be a huge uh, computation to do. So you, you cannot really do it. Can I summarize? So uh, H is going to be a function defined over uh, every vertex in your graph, right? Uh, and W instead is going to be like a kernel as well? Or is it... But in this w, case... W is, is going to be a function like this. So W is a spectral function. W hat is a spectral function. So yeah. you, you are working in the frequency space. In the frequency space, you are working with this what, this, is, this is a spectral function. So for example, if you, if you know image processing a little bit, so for example, if you want to do image denoising, if you want to do image denoising, what you, what you know is that you know that the noise is usually in the high frequency part of your image, of okay. your signal. Sure. So what you can do is that you can design a spectral filter, which is going to be zero for the high frequency. And you are going to preserve you know, the low frequency to preserve your, your geometry. So this is just you know, doing filtering of, your, of the frequencies uh, you know, contained in your signal. Oh, okay, okay, but the W without the hat would be still a small guy, right? Would be a small uh, filter. Exactly, so W without hat is the spatial filter. Yeah, the small one, right? Which is, again- Exactly, so, okay, exactly. Okay, okay. so if you have the grid, uh, W will be, you know, a three by three, uh, a three by three, you know, the, uh, patch, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. I see, okay, okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, so in the context of graph, uh, so it, it's, a, it's a small property um, uh, to know is that you don't have any shift invariance. Um, so if you have a grid and if you are using the convolutional um, theorem uh, to, to move around you know, uh, your function, for example, the function is a Gaussian here, on the grid, you are not going to change the shape of your function. But on a graph, because you have you know, uh, irregular structure, if you move around your Gaussian, then you will have different shapes. Okay, so this is something that, that you lose when you go uh, to graphs, but in practice, actually, it has absolutely no effect. So it's, it's not really important. It's just a mathematical property that you lose when, when you go to graphs. Okay. 
there is another right. question. Uh, there is another yes. question I got here. So can you ask? Can you remind us uh, what is actually the overall goal here? What is the goal of defining these convolutions or the spectral correspondence over these graphs? I think uh, maybe it's not. Uh, yeah, if we can remind everyone, it's going to be. Yeah. So so when, when I'm trying, the, the the goal of the lecture is to define uh, convolutional uh, graph convolutional nets. Okay. So I need to redefine uh, convolution in the case of graphs. And there are two ways to define convolutions. Uh, you can do convolution with template matching, or you can do convolution with um, a graph spectral theory. So what I'm doing here, um, I'm, I'm redefining convolution in the case of uh, spectral theory. And then I'm going to use this definition of convolution uh, to define uh, graph convolutional nets. So my goal is just to define convolution in the case of graphs, so I can I can I can design uh, graph uh, convolutional nets. Yeah, sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go to um, now. Okay, so now the first part was okay. I I define uh, spectral convolution. Now I'm going to use spectral convolution to define uh, GCN. Okay. Okay. So the first model, uh, what I call vanilla spectral GCN was introduced actually by, by Yann uh, Leca and his collaborators, so uh, John uh, Bruna, Zaremba, and Arthur Slam in 2014. I think it was for the first uh, ICLIAR conference. Um, and what they did, they did, they, they did you know, the, the simple uh, idea to do, uh, okay, let's, let's, let's uh, you know, define a graph uh, spectral convolutional layer. So we know what is, you know, uh, a standard convolutional layer. So you, you, this is the activation at the next layer, A plus one. This is your nonlinear activation. So this is, for example, Rilu. Um, and then I'm going to do the spatial filter. So the template WR, convolution by HR. Okay, so this is in the spatial domain, uh, or the graph domain. And then I'm going to do that. And remember that what I just defined, so doing this convolution in the spectral domain, it's just doing that. Okay, so this is the spectral filter. Uh, apply to the Laplacian, and then you multiply by HL, okay? So this guy is, is um, I can decompose this guy. I will get the Fourier uh, matrix times the spectral function that I apply to the eigenvalues, uh, phi transpose HL, okay? And, and, and this, is my, uh, this is my spectral filter, okay? So I do not work directly here, okay? I work directly here, and, and here, the thing that I'm going to learn, I'm going actually to learn this function w hat lambda one. So I'm going to learn um, the spectral filter, and I'm going to learn it by backpropagation. Okay, so I don't need to, um, you know, handcraft the, the the spectral filter. I don't need to do that. This will be learned by backpropagation. So that was really a great idea to do it, and this was the first spectral technique. But it, but it has some limitations. So the first limitation is that you don't have any guarantee of special localization of filters. Uh, so remember that uh, what we want, we want to have the local reception field because it's, it's a very good property to be able to extract, uh, you know, multi-scale um, multi feature, multi-scale patterns from, from your signal. So you don't, have in, you don't have this guarantee. The second thing is that how many parameters do you, do you need to learn? So you need to learn N parameters, okay? You need to learn this W hat lambda one to W hat lambda N. So it's N parameters. So if the, again, if the graph is, is large, like, uh, like, uh, like the, the web, you know, or Facebook, then this is gonna be billions uh, of, uh, of parameters to learn. And this is for each layer. So it's gonna be really huge. And again, the learning complexity is gonna be N square because your phi is a dense matrix. So, so we need to improve this. So, so, uh, so Jan um, and his collaborators, so they improve, um, the, um, they improve two properties. So the first property was, okay, uh, how do we get localized spatial filters? Okay, so for this, what, what, what they propose is to, um, okay, to get um, localized uh, spatial filters, so you want something which is localized, uh, what you need to do is to uh, compute smooth spectral filters, something very smooth like this, okay? 
So why do you why do you want smooth space for filter? It's because if you have smooth in the frequency space, then you are going to be localized in the space domain. Okay, so this is in physics, you know, the Heisenberg identity principle, uh, and you can see that you know with the Parseval identity. If let's let's say that k is equal to one. If k is equal to one, you have the first derivative of uh, of the spectral function. So if you want this to be small, okay, so you're going to have a smooth function. And for k equal to one, you see here is this is going to be the variance of your spatial filter. So if this is small, if the variance is small, it means that you, you're going to have a small, um, you're going to have a spatial filter with a, a small compact uh, support. Okay, so if you are smooth in the frequency space, you're going to be localized in the spatial space. Okay, so you need smoothness. How do you get smoothness for spectral filter? So you can also think about the uh, the transform of the delta of the Dirac, right? So we have, if we have a delta in Dirac in the in the time domain, then in the frequency we're going to have basically a flat, a completely flat uh, transform, right? So that's exactly. another maybe way to see uh, if someone doesn't quite know the Parseval identity. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, right. Um, and so, so how do you get a smooth spectral filter? So the idea is, OK, uh, we can simply decompose uh, you know, the, the spectral filter uh, to be a linear combination of smooth kernels. OK, so the smooth kernel uh, was uh, chosen to be splines, uh, because splines are nice. They are you know, uh, with compact support, and they are smooth. And basically, the idea is, OK, now let's learn um, a vector of k coefficient. Uh, and this is a k smooth kernel. OK? And you learn this coefficient by backpropagation. But suddenly, you know, uh, everything is nice because you have lo localization in space. And the number of parameters that you're going to learn is going to be k parameters. So k, for example, let's say it's 9. OK? Remember that before? Uh, in the case of, um, of convolution, so you have a tree by tree, which is, which is nine parameters. So that can be the same. You can have nine parameters to learn. You're going you're gonna to learn a combination of nine uh, spline functions, and, um, and that's it. So you have a constant number of parameters to learn per layer. So this is nice. Uh, but we still have, you know, the, the phi uh, matrix. So the, we, the learning complexity is, is still quadratic. Okay. OK, so, so the question is, um, how do we learn in linear time? OK, so how do we learn uh, with respect to the, to the graph size, n? So the problem of the quadratic complexity comes from directly from the use of the Laplacian eigenvectors. OK, so you see that um, the thing that is, that is annoying uh, in this spectral convolution is not this diagonal matrix. It's not this vector. It's this guy. OK, this is, this is the phi uh, matrix. Because it's a full matrix, right? It's a dense matrix. And, and, then, and then it's an n square number of elements. So this is the price that we need to pay. So we know that if we want to avoid the quadratic complexity, we need to avoid the eigen decomposition. OK? Um, and, and OK, so we can avoid eigen decomposition by simply directly learn function of the Laplacian. OK, so this is what, what we proposed in 2000. Uh, uh, 2016. So the spectral uh, function is just going to be, uh, you know, uh, a monomial uh, function of the Laplacian. That's it. So we just have a sum of some parameters that we learn by bike propagation, uh, WK, and Laplacian to the power of K. Okay. So, so when we do that, uh, first there is something uh, which is which is good is that. Uh, we're going to have filters that are exactly localized in a K-hop support. Okay, so if we have the Laplacian to the power K, the spectral, um, I mean the spatial filters will be exactly localized in the support of K-hop. So what is a what is a one-hop neighbor neighborhood? So let's say for example you have this graph, and here I'm going to put a heat source. So the value is going to be one at this uh, node and zero for all other nodes. If I apply the Laplacian to this heat source, then the signal, the support of the signal, is going to be increased by one hop. So every, uh, basically every node that can be reached by one jump, okay, that you do that. And, and if you do two jumps from this, you will, you will reach the, 
the second hop uh, neighborhood, which is the orange, uh, the orange uh, nodes here. Okay. So if you apply the Laplacian uh, two times, this is going to be the support. Okay. If you apply the Laplacian k times, then you will have a support of k hops. So you you exactly uh, control the um, the size of your spatial filters. Okay. So that that was the first point. The second point, let me show you that you get uh, learning complexity. Okay, so so again, uh, you have your convolution, WH, uh, you have your spectral convolution definition. I'm using here uh, as a spectral convolution um, monomials of the, of the Laplacian. And then I'm going to replace this guy, so the Laplacian power of K times the vector H by the vector XK, okay? And xk is actually given by your recursive equation. Okay, so recursive is always good, right? So it's given by this recursive equation, which is uh, the Laplacian uh, times uh, the vector xk minus one. And the xk equal to zero is simply the original uh, function h, okay? So, so when I do that, you see that this sequence x of k is generated by multiplying a matrix, uh, so the Laplacian, and a vector xk minus one. So the complexity of doing that is the number of edges, okay? And you do it that, you know, k times. So number of edges uh, times k. And the thing is, uh, for real graph, uh, real world graphs, um, basically they are all sparse, okay? Because sparsity is structure. So remember, for example, for, um, for, for the web, the web has billions of, of web pages but for each web page, it is in average connected to 50 other web pages. So comparing 50 to 1 billion is, is nothing. So usually, uh, and the same also for the brain. The brain, it's very highly sparse. The same also for uh, transport networks. So everything, every natural graph is usually sparse because sparsity is structure, okay? So, so the number of edges is, you know, some value times n. So at the end of the day, uh, you have linear complexity. Uh, because uh, for, for sparse uh, real-world graphs, okay? Um, okay, so, and you see here is that I'm using the Laplacian and I never do any eigen decomposition of the Laplacian, okay? Um, and there is, so there is a bit of, um, uh, of confusion that sometimes I see is that, so I call this spectral, uh, you know, GCN, but this, is, this might be misguided. Because I don't do any spectral uh, operations. Like, you know, I don't use any eigen decomposition with the Laplacian. With, I don't have any eigenvectors, eigenvalues. So, be, so at the end of the day, even if I use, you know, the spectral theory to define this GCN, um, at the end of the day, the computation are all done in the spatial domain using the Laplacian. Okay, I don't use any, I don't use the spectral domain for the computation. I use, I do everything in the spatial domain. So even if we call that spectral uh, GCN, we don't use, you know, in practice, uh, the spectral uh, decomposition. So just, just one, 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 one comment. Okay, and the last, the last comment I wanna do is that, so graph convolutional layers, again, this is just linear operations. So you just multiply a vector, uh, a matrix by a vector. So we're just doing linear operations. So this is GPU friendly. The issue um, is that, here you are doing sparse linear algebra. And the existing GPU are not optimized for that. So this is, I think, one of the limitations today for graph neural networks. We need to have specialized hardware for graph neural networks. We need to have hardware that adapt uh, to, the, uh, to the sparsity uh, of, of these operations. And we don't have this today. So uh, if we want this to, 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 to get far, very far with graph neural networks, we need to have this, this, uh, this specialized hardware. What about TPUs? Do you know whether TPUs can handle? That's the same. That's oh. the same. They are optimized for uh, full, uh, you know, uh, linear operations like full matrices. Uh, they, are, they are specialized for that. Mm -hmm. But if you if you want to do sparse linear algebra, you need specialized hardware to do that. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So how do we implement? Um, how do we implement this? Uh, so for example, we have a signal. Uh, we have a function defined on the, on the graph. So n is the number of vertices of your graph and d is the dimensionality uh, of, 
of the feature, right? So for each node, you have um, a feature or vector uh, of d dimension. Okay. So how we do that? So we have xk, and what we do is that we are just going to uh, re shape uh, stuff to do just linear operations. So xk are going to be arranged in a matrix, uh, you know, um, uh, x bar, which is of the size of k times n d. Okay. So we just reshape, you know, this xk uh, to be one times n d, and and then we have k times n d, and then we multiply this by the vector that we will learn by backpropagation, which is of the size k by one. Okay, we do that. The operation would give you one times n d. You reshape and you get n times d. So this is how how I, I implement it, you know, uh, with PyTorch or, or TensorFlow. That would be the same. Uh, and this is how you do um, this uh, spectral convolution. So uh, again, the property is that filters are exactly localized. Uh, you have a constant number of parameters uh, to learn. So this is a k, uh, you know, this is this is this k uh, parameters that you need to learn by backpropagation. You have a learning complexity, a, a linear learning complexity. Uh, but the thing uh, which uh, which is not good is that um, here I'm using monomial um, basis. Okay, so I'm using uh, Laplacian to the power zero, Laplacian to the power one, power two, power three, and so on. Okay, this is what I use here. And the thing is, monomial bases are unstable for, uh, for, for optimization because this basis, you know, is not ortho ortho orthogonal. So if you change one coefficient, then you are going to change the approximation of your function. So you need orthogonality if you want to learn uh, with stability. Okay, so then you can use your favorite, you know, uh, orthonormal uh, basis, but your favorite orthonormal basis must have the, a recursive equation. Okay, so um, this is the only thing that 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 you that you need. You need your orthonormal basis to to have a recursive equation because this is the key to have the linear complexity. So we use a Chebyshev uh, polynomials. So this is um, something very well known in signal processing. Um, so we are going to approximate, you know, the spectral convolution uh, with Chebyshev uh, uh, function. The Chebyshev functions applied to H, again, can be represented by xk, and xk is given by this recursive equation. Okay, so it's a little more complex than before, but uh, in practice, this is just doing, again, multiplication of uh, your Laplacian times the vec uh, one vector. Okay, at the end of the day, uh, the, the complexity is still linear. You don't change anything. Um, and this time, you have stability uh, during, your, during the learning uh, process. OK, so what we did, we did the sanity check uh, with MNIST. Um, so, and you see that. So this is the number of uh, vertices. So, so for MNIST, the, the graph is the standard grid. OK, we use a k-nearest uh, neighbor uh, grid to do that. And you see that um, you have linear complexity. OK, this is the, the number of, uh, of vertices. And, and, and you have this number of, of um, you have the linear complexity. So this is good. For the accuracy, we get also 99% uh, of accuracy compared to the uh, standard Lenet 5. Okay, so Chebnet, uh, so Chebnet is basically Comnet for arbitrary graph, and we have the same linear learning complexity. Of course, uh, the complexity constant is much larger than than the standard uh, le, uh, than the standard Comnet. So it's something like twenty or thirty. So it's much much smaller uh, to learn on this, but you get you know uh, Comnet for any arbitrary graph. So that's that's uh, that's what you win. Uh, another limitation is um, it's an isotropic model. So, so let me talk a little bit about I, uh, isotropy versus anisotropy. So if you look at you know, the standard convnets, then you are going to produce anisotropic filters, like this one. Okay, so you see that this filter is anisotropic. It goes in, in this direction. Okay? And we can get anisotropic filters with uh, standard convnets because we are using a grid. And on a grid, we have, you know, uh, directional, we have directions. We know where is the up, where is down, where is left, where is right, right? Remember that we know the ordering of, uh, of the nodes on, on the grid, we know that. Uh, but this is different for graphs. We don't have any notion of direction. We, we don't know where is, the, where is up, where is down, where is left, where is right. So the thing, the, the only thing that we can do at this point is that we can only compute isotropic filters. 
isotropic filters means that the value of the filter will be the same, you know, for in, in all directions uh, for, 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 for cycles, okay, for, for, for cycles of the same radius. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what we can get. We can only get uh, isotropic uh, filters when we use a chip net because we have no notion of direction on arbitrary graphs. And I will come back to that. I will come back to the isotropy versus anisotropy uh, a bit later. Okay, so what we, what we did also is to uh, very quickly, I don't, I don't have the time. Oh, wow, the time is... Uh, so I need to speed up a little bit. So uh, we, did, we did extend also this um, spectral convolution from uh, one graph to multiple graphs. So you can do that. You know, it's like extending from 1D signal processing to 2D image processing. Uh, so extension is mathematically uh, straightforward uh, to do. And, and we did that, you know, for, for example, for recommender systems, because we have users of movies and users of graphs. So with that, we also... As I said before, is that you can use your favorite, uh, you know, orthogonal uh, uh, polynomial basis. Uh, so we use uh, Kylie nets because uh, che Chebyshev uh, are unstable to localize frequency bands of interest, which are basically the graph communities. Uh, we use that uh, something um, a, a, a more powerful, um, you know, um, a more powerful spectral functions. Uh, okay, which is Kylie net. Okay, so now let me go to the to, the, to this class of uh, graph convenets that I call special graph convenets. And then for this class, I'm going back to the template matching, uh, you know, definition of convolution. So how we do template matching for graphs. So remember that um, the main issue, um, the main issue when you want to do template matching for graph is that uh, you, you don't have any node ordering or positioning for your template, okay? Uh, we don't have any, Positioning. So basically, we, the only thing that we have, we have the, the, the index uh, of the nodes, and that's it. But the index is not enough to match, you know, information between between nodes. Um, so how can we design template matching to be invariant to node reparameterization? Okay. So you have a graph. This uh, index of the node is maybe let's say uh, six, but it's completely arbitrary. I can have an index with the number. 122, for example. So I want to be able to do template matching independently of the index of this node, okay? So how, how I do that? So the simplest things you can do is actually to uh, have only one, uh, you know, template uh, vector to do the matching. This is, so you don't have, you know, W, G1, W, G2, W, G3, you don't have this. You just have one vector, W, and you are doing the matching of this vector with all other, you know, uh, feature on your on your graph. Okay, this is the simplest template feature uh, matching you can do, which is invariant by node reparameterization. And actually, this property is going to be used for most graph neural networks today. Okay, so here is the mathematical definition. Um, so I'm just going to do the uh, the product between. Uh, the template vector W uh, at layer L. So this is a D by one. And, and, and I have the vector at node J, uh, which is also the dimensionality D by one. Okay, so I will get a scalar. So here, this is only for one feature. Of course, you will have to get more features. So instead of having a vector D by one, you're going to use a matrix uh, D by D. So this way you can uh, get, you know, D features for each node I, okay? And then, I, so this is the, the representation at, at, uh, at node i. I can put everything in vectorial representation, okay? This is, my, um, this is my activation at layer A plus one. It is defined on, on the graph of n vertices, and it has d dimensions, okay? And, and this can be rewritten as uh, the adjacency matrix A. So this is the n by n matrix. This is my activation at the layer L. So this is the n by d, uh, you know, uh, matrix. And this is the, the template uh, that I'm going to learn by backpropagation of the size d by d, okay? So you do, you do this product, you get n by d. Okay, so based on this template matching of graph, now I'm going to define uh, two classes 
of uh, spatial uh, GCN, which are the isotropy GCN and the anisotropy GCN. So let's start with the isotropy GCN. So this is act actually has, has, a, has quite some history, okay? So uh, the simplest formulation of special GCN was introduced by uh, uh, Scarcelli and his co-author. So it was in 2009 before the deep learning revolution. And then more recently by uh, Thomas Keith, Max Welling, um, and also uh, Sayan Sukbata and uh, Arthur Slam and Rob Fergus in 2016. So this is actually, um, this graph neural network, so what I call the vanilla uh, graph uh, convolutional uh, nets, okay? This is exactly the same definition that I have before. I just here, I put, you know, the GV matrix in a such a way that I have the mean value, okay? I just do the mean value over the neighborhood, okay? But this is exactly the, the, the equation that I used before, okay? Um, and you see that, so this equation is, uh, it can handle uh, absence of node ordering. So this is completely invariant to node re re reparameterization. So again, if this index is maybe six and I change to be 122, it's not gonna change anything in the computation of, the, of H at the next layer. It's not gonna change anything. You can also deal with a uh, neighborhood of different sizes, okay? You don't care if you have uh, a neighborhood of four nodes or neighborhood of 10 nodes, it's not gonna change, or 100 nodes, it's not gonna change anything. You have the, the local reception field by design with graph neural network, you just need to look at the neighbors and, and that's it, so it's, it's given to you. You have weight sharing, okay? You have weight sharing, it means that uh, for, for all features, you are going to use the same W, whatever the position on the graph, okay? So this is a convolution property. Um, this formulation is also independent of the graph size because all operations are done locally, okay? You just use, you know, local information for the next, for the next layer. So you can have a graph of 10 nodes or you can have a graph, a graph of 10 billion nodes. Uh, it doesn't care. So you can do also everything in parallel. And, but this is limited to isotropic cap capability. So the W is the same for all neighbors. So it's, again, it's an isotropic uh, model. It's going to give the same value for all neighbors, okay? But at the end of the day, this model uh, can be represented by this figure. So um, this, uh, so the activation at the next layer is basically a function of the activation at the current layer at uh, index, uh, at, 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 at the node i and the neighborhood of the node i, okay? And the only thing that we're gonna do basically uh, is to change the function, the instantiation of, of the function. And then you will get all uh, family of graph uh, neural network by just, you know, deciding uh, a different function here. But everything is based on this equation. So again, you have your, your, your core uh, uh, node and then you have your neighborhood to decide what will be the activation at the next layer. Okay, so I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm not going to take too much time on this, but what you can show is that this uh, previous Vanilla GCN I just uh, show you is actually a simplification of Chebnet. So if you truncate the expansion of Chebnet by using the first two uh, Chebnet-Chef uh, function, that at the end, you end up with the same equation. So, so this, is, this is the relationship. Uh, okay, so uh, one interesting uh, uh, GCN is GraphSage that was introduced by uh, William Hamilton, uh, Lee, and Yuri Leskovec. Uh, so let's say for, let's, let's go back to the vanilla GCN. So, and let's suppose that the adjacency matrix uh, has a value one for, for, for the edges, okay? So I have this equation. So the thing is, for this equation, I'm going to treat, you know, the central vertex I and the neighborhood with the same template weight, okay? But I can differentiate that, you know, I can have a template for the central node, W1, and I can have a template for the one hop neighborhood, okay? By doing that, you, you improve already a lot, you know, your, the performance of your, of your graph neural networks. Uh, so you go from here to here. So you have, again, um, some template for the central node and a template for, for the neighborhood, okay? But this is still an isotropic, uh, isotropic GCN. Okay, because you are treating all the neighbors with the same weight. Uh, here, this is the mean, but you can change. You can take the sum. You can also take the max. You can take also something more elaborated like LSTM. 
Okay, now more recently, people um, try to improve the, um, uh, the theoretical understanding of, uh, of GCN. So there was um, the graph isomorphos, isomorphism uh, network, so introduced by um, Yuri Leskovec <coughs> uh, uh, in 2018. So the idea is, can we design an architecture that can differentiate graphs that are not isomorphic? So you know isomorphic um, is basically a, a measure of equivalence between, between graphs. So these two graphs are isomorphic to each other. And of course, you want to treat them the same way. But if you are not isomorphic, you want especially to treat them in a different way, okay? So, so there was um, a graph neural network uh, based on this one, on this, on this definition, but is, is this still an isotropic uh, GCN? Okay, so, so now I'm going to talk about anisotropic GCN. So again, um, <clears throat> uh, again, so I, I go back to what I said before is that standard covenant can produce uh, anisotropic filters because there is a, um, a notion of directions on grids, okay? So you, you have this um, anisotropic filter in this direction. Uh, GCN, like a Chemnet, Kylinet, Vanilla GCN, GraphSage, and Gene, they compute isotropic filters. So you have this kind of, uh, of filters that you learn uh, during the process, but they are, they are isotropic. But we know that anisotropy is very powerful, right? So um, how do we get back anisotropy in graph neural networks? So you can, you can get anisotropy naturally. For example, if you have edge features um, for like, if you take in chemistry molecules, you know that uh, the bond features can be different. They can be, you know, single, double, aromatic bonds. So naturally you would get anisotropic, uh, you know, uh, GCN. Uh, and again, if we want to design um, a mechanism for anisotropy, we want this mechanism to be independent with respect to the node parametrization. So to do that, we can use, for example, edge degrees, and so that was proposed by Monet, edge gate that we propose um, in Getty GCN or attention mechanism uh, in GAT. And the idea is what, what I put here as an illustration. Okay, so um, here you're going to treat your neighbors in the same way, okay? So with the same template. But you want, you want to treat your neighbors in a different way, right? If this is J1, you want a different weight than if it was for J2. Why do you want that is, for example, if you want to analyze uh, graphs, you know that you, you have communities of people um, which are different. For example, I don't know if it is politics, you have Republicans and Democrats. So you don't want you know, to have the, the same analysis for, for the same group of people. So you want anisotropy for graphs, that, that, that's quite important. Okay, so the first model uh, who deal with anisotropy was Monet. So it was introduced by Federico Monti, Michael Bronstein, and, and their co-author. And the idea was to do uh, was to use GMM, so Gaussian mixture model, and to learn the parameters of the Gaussian mixture. So here they have K Gaussian mixture model, and they learn the parameters by using the degree of uh, of the graph. Um, then there is also GAT. So uh, was developed by uh, Peter uh, Velikovic and uh, Joshua Benjo and their co-author, was basically to use the attention mechanism developed by uh, Jimmy Badano, Joshua Benjo, and, and Cho to introduce anisotropy in the neighborhood regression function, okay? And so this is, this is what you see here. So you have, um, you are going to concatenate, so it's a multi-head um, multi architecture. And here you have uh, this weight, which are basically the softmax um, on the neighborhood, okay? You do the softmax on the neighborhood, so some, inform, some, um, some nodes will be more important than the others, you know, by, given by softmax. Uh, what we use um, with um, Thomas Laurent um, and me in 2017, we, we, we use a simple uh, age uh, getting mechanism, which is, which is, which is you know, what, a sort of soft attention process uh, compared to the sparse attention mechanism uh, of Yoshua Benjo. And, and here, what we did also, we use uh, edge feature explicitly. And this actually, recently, we discovered that this is very important for edge prediction task. If you have explicit prediction task, this is important to, to keep it, okay? So, so this is the model that we used, uh, okay. Um, then, okay, so if I take transformer and if I, if I uh, write down the equation of the graph version of transformer, this is the data we get, okay? Uh, so you recognize here the value, here you have the query, here you have the key, and here you have the softmax, but the softmax is done in the neighborhood, the one hop neighborhood, okay, that would be this. 
And here I'm going to make um, um, a connection with a transformer of uh, Vasmani and, and, and his collaborators. So what is a transformer? So a standard transformer is actually a special case of uh, graph conventional nets when the graph is fully connected. Okay, so this is a fully connected graph. So you take uh, any node, uh, I, and this node is going to be connected to all other nodes in your graph and included itself, okay? So if you look at this equation, the equation I just wrote before, you know, if the, the neighborhood uh, is this time uh, not the one hop neighborhood, but the whole graph, then you will get, you know, uh, the standard equation that if, if you do an LP and, and, and transformer, you will recognize directly. Okay. Yeah, we, saw this last, we saw this last week. So just exactly. So that's, yeah. a, that's a nice, connect, a nice uh, uh, transition. So, so you see, you have the concatenation. So this is multi head. You have the softmax, the query, the key, and the value. And then you have the weight uh, for the multi head. So, and the only thing that I do here mathematically is just having the neighborhood uh, that, uh, that use uh, you know, all connection. And when I do that, so there is the question. So what does it mean to do, uh, you know, graph uh, convolutional nets for fully connected graphs? And I think in this case, it becomes less useful to talk about graphs. Because when you, when you have each data connected to all other data, then you don't have any more, you know, specific graph structure. Because a graph, what is, what is really interesting with graph is the sparsity structure, right? Like the brain connectivity, like, uh, you know, the social networks. What is interesting is not everything to be connected to each other. It's only to have a sparse connection between, between, between the nodes. So I think in this case, it would be better to talk about sets than to talk about graphs. And, and we know that. We know that transformers are set neural networks. So, so in some sense, instead of, you know, looking at, you know, a fully connected graphs with, with, uh, with feature, the thing that we should look at is more a set of feature. And transformers are really good, you know, to process uh, sets of, uh, of, of, of uh, feature vectors. Um, okay, so, so there is a lab uh, that I, I, uh, I put here. So um, the lab is based on, um, so this is the gated GCN, so the, the model I, I, um, I proposed, and this is with GGL. So this is the deep graph library. So it was developed by NYMU uh, Shanghai by Professor Zheng Zheng. And, uh, and, and here, this is the link to the lab. So if you click uh, on this link, you will go directly uh, to, to the lab. Uh, and this is this using Google, Google Collab. So you will just need a, you know, a Gmail account to access to this, and you will be able to run it on, on, on the Google Cloud. Mm -hmm. And what I put here, I put really you know, the, the, only the, the most interesting uh, functions that you need to develop uh, a GCM. So, uh, so, so maybe tomorrow. Uh, yeah, yeah, tomorrow, we, to, tomorrow we're going to yeah. be going over everything here. Okay, perfect. Okay, you will do that. Yeah. Okay, so, and, and here uh, I, I gave, you know, I put some comments on the code. Uh, yeah, I saw, I saw. And I saw. also, yeah, also understand DGL, uh, how, how DGL works. So probably yeah. we do that tomorrow. Yes, yes, yes. Nice. Okay. So let me now, I'm going to the end. So let me talk a little bit about um, benchmarking uh, graph neural networks. So recently we, um, we have this paper of uh, benchmarking graph neural networks. So why we did this benchmark? Um, because in, in, um, if you look at you know, most published um, uh, GCN papers, um, most of the work actually use small data set like Cora or TU data set and only one task, like classification. And when I, you know, when I started doing some experiment on that, I just realized that if you use GCN or if you don't use any GCN, you will get statistically the same performance because the standard deviation is very high for these small data sets. So, so the thing is, um, we, we cannot identify, you know, good uh, GCN. Uh, we, need, we, need, we need something else. And also recently, so there, there has been, you know, a new theoretical development for, for GCN. And the question is, you know, how good they are in practice. It's, it's important to, to have some good mathematical justification of GCN, but, you know, uh, we, we need to be able to prove that this is something that is useful. And, and, and I think also to, uh, benchmark has been very essential to make progress uh, in many fields. Um, like, you know, of course, deep learning with the ImageNet by uh, Fei uh, Lee. Um, but the thing is, what I observe is actually that people are quite reluctant to give credit to, to, to benchmarks. Um, anyway, so we introduced this open benchmark infrastructure. So it's, it's on GitHub. 
and it's based on PyTorch and, and DGL. And we introduced, you know, six uh, new medium scale data sets for the four fundamental graph problems, like, you know, graph classification, uh, graph regression, node classification, and edge classification, which I think if you cover these four fundamental graph problems, you, you, you already know uh, quite a lot about the performance of your, of your GCN. Can you spend a few um, words more about these four fundamental graph problems? I think we haven't mentioned them uh, so far, I think. Yeah, um, exactly. But, but what, so what I mentioned is basically the first part of any you know, convolutional nets is how do you extract a powerful feature? The rest is quite easy. You know, if you want to do sure. uh, regression, you just use an MLP. If you want to do classification, you should use MLP with cross entropy. Uh, the thing I think is, is uh, I mean, I can take more time to do that, but what I present is, I think, is more, uh, you know, uh, is more interesting than uh, than doing just these these guys. But yeah, I was if you give me an, another like, hour, we can, we could do that. <laughs> I, I was making the point that I, I think I understand now how we can build a basically a representation of a graph. But then, so you would have like this uh, basically uh, feature per node. But then, how would you go from this feature per node to the final task? So maybe we can mention this such that we can give some more. Sure. So so what you do basically? Um, so for example, if uh, so you have feature exactly. So you extract convolutional feature per node. And, and then suddenly, if you want to do, for example, graph classification. So what you will do, you will do some kind of aggregation uh, you know, function on this feature node. So for example, the most common one is to do the average. So you do the average of all uh, feature nodes. And then on the top of that, you use an MLP. And then you will do classification uh, of, of your graph. And this would and this be for always the same kind of structure of the graph, or you have different uh, structures, like different numbers of nodes? So is it like? Would you use no, the if, if you use the mean, it's completely independent of the number of nodes. Right, right, right. And the same. So, so if, you do, if you do yeah. the sum, if you do the max, so you have many operators which are independent of the number of nodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, so so we have this, and um, and this medium size, uh, this medium size are actually enough, you know, to statistically separate uh, the performance of graph uh, neural networks. So we make easy, you know, for new users to add a new G, uh, new uh, graph uh, graph uh, models and also new data set. And this is this is the link to the to the repo. So let me now uh, explain the graph neural network pipeline. So a standard graph neural network pipeline is composed of three layers. So the first layer is going to be an input layer and is going to make an embedding of the input node and edge features. Then you will have um, a series of graph neural network layers. And finally, you will have a task layer. So there will be a prediction layer for graph, node, and edge uh, task. Let me now describe in details you know, uh, each of these three layers. So for the input layer, um, so again, we will have you know, the input, node, and edge features. So this comes from uh, the application. That can be you know, a node feature, for example, for um, you know, for recommend for recommender system for product, so it will give you you know some feature of your product. So what you will do is that you will take this um, this raw feature and you will make you know an embedding, a linear embedding, and you will get a vector of d dimensions. Uh, we can do the same if we have some edge feature. We can do an embedding of the input um, edge feature, and we will get a vector of d dimension. So basically, the output of the um, uh, embedding layer will be. Um, uh, for H, uh, it's going to be a matrix of n nodes and d, uh, d dimension for d features. Uh, for the edge, it's going to be a matrix of uh, e the number of edges times uh, the, the the number of uh, features. And then, so we will give that. And we will give uh, you know um, this output of the embedding layer. Is going to be the input of the graph neural network layers, okay? Which is which is here. Um, then what we will do is that we will apply um, our favorite uh, graph neural network layer um, uh, a number of l times, okay? So we have um, the the node and the edge representation at layer l. It will go through uh, the GNN layer, and it will give you know, the representation of h and e at the next layer. And we will do that you know, l number of times. This will give us you know, uh, the output of the uh, graph neural network layers 
And again, it's going to be a matrix of n nodes and d dimensions for the nodes. And for the edges, it's going to be a matrix of uh, uh, e, uh, which is the number of edges times uh, the dimensionality. Okay, so this is the output of our graph uh, neural network layers. And then finally, for the last layer, so this is a uh, you know, task-based uh, layer. So if we, if we are doing some prediction at the graph uh, levels, what happens is that we are going to take you know, the, um, the output of the graph neural network layers, and we're going to make a mean um, with respect to all nodes of the graph. Okay? So this will give us um, a representation of the graph of d dimension. Then we will give that through, uh, to an MLP, uh, multi-layer perceptron. And it will give us, you know, a score which can be a scalar if we are doing some graph regression, like you know, chemical uh, property uh, estimation, or it can be a classification if we are trying to classify, you know, molecules to some uh, classes. Um, we can also have, you know, a, a node-level prediction. So what we will do is that we will take um, the node representation at uh, the output of the graph neural network. Uh, and we will give that to an MLP, and we will get a score for the node i, which can be a scalar for regression or can be a k um, dimensional vector for classification. We can also do, uh, you know, edge level prediction. So we have a, a link uh, uh, between node i and node j. Uh, it's going to be a concatenation of the, uh, you know, the graph neural network uh, uh, representation for node i and node j. We give that to an MLP, and again, we have a score for the link between node i and node j, and it can be regression or classification. Okay, so quickly, um, because I'm running out of time, so the task, you have the graph classification task, uh, the graph regression task, sorry. So this is for molecules. So here we want to predict, you know, uh, the molecular solubility. And here you have the table. Uh, so this is like, you know, uh, agnostic uh, GCN. So we don't use any graph structure. Uh, the lower the better. And, and here, this is isotropic uh, GCN, and this is anisotropic GCN. So usually you will see that um, for most experiments, um, anisotropic GCN uh, do better job than, than isotropic uh, GCN because you use some, uh, of course, some directional property. So this is for graph regression. This is for graph classification. So you have super nodes of, um, uh, of images, and you want to classify the, um, uh, the image to belong to one of, of the classes. Uh, you also have um, age classification. Uh, so uh, this is here the combinatorial optimization problem of uh, TSP, so the traveling salesman uh, problem. So you have a graph, and then you want to know if this edge belongs to the solution. So if it belongs to the solution, this is a class uh, one, and if it doesn't belong, this is class zero. And we see that here you need explicit uh, edge feature. So you see that the only model that does a good job compared to the naive uh, heuristic is, is by using explicit um, edge feature. Okay, so here I'm using, I'm using uh, this combinatorial uh, example to make a, a workshop announcement. So this is also what we organizing next year with, with Jan uh, and also um, Peter Bataglia, Stephanie Jigelka, Andrea Lodi, Stan Osher, Oyo Vignan, and Max Welling. So we're organizing a workshop on combining deep learning and combinatorial optimization, which I think is very interesting direction of research. Okay, conclusion. Um, so uh, we generalize the convnet to data on graphs. For this, we, we needed to redesign a convolution opera uh, operator on graphs. So we do that for template matching, uh, which lead to the class of spatial uh, GCN. We also did that with um, spectral convolution, which lead to the class of um, spectral convolution, uh, spectral GCN. Uh, we have linear complexity for uh, real-world uh, graphs. We have GPU implementation, but yet it's not optimized for the GPU that we, that we have today. Uh, we have universal learning capacity, so this is uh, the recent theoretical works. And we can do that for multiple graphs and also for graphs that, that, that can change you know, dy dynamically. Application, so, I'm happy now that uh, I don't need to justify anymore the why we are doing graph convolutional nets to, to anybody. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's getting more and more uh, application. Uh, we see that at the nice, uh, at the last, um, actually um, uh, this week, um, ICLEAR uh, conference. So um, the, 
the the keyword that gets you know the most uh, improvement was graph uh, neural networks and and you can have you know uh, you have now you know a workshop and tutorials on graph neural networks at, at, at many of the top uh, deep learning and ai conferences uh, this is um, the first uh, probably tutorials on graph uh, deep learning that we we organized at the in 2017 and cdpr and also if you want some materials to uh, to look more so we have this um, IPAN uh, workshop um, uh, organized in 2018 and also a follow-up in 2019. And for this, we have the video talks. So if you want to, to know more about this. Uh, so uh, yeah, I would like to thank my co-writers. So Joshua Benjo, Michael Bronstein, uh, Federico Monti, uh, Chris, uh, Chataina uh, Joshi, uh, Vijay De G. Willy, uh, Yo Leo, Thomas Laurent, Arthur Slam, Ron Levy, Michael De Ferrand, Pierre Van Der Geis, and Patrick Eggman. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was, it was really impressive. And I think everyone here was stunned by your the quality of the slides and your explanations. We really, really enjoyed like I'm getting so many private messages here. I'm, <laughs> it's like, like uh, everyone's pretty, very excited. Uh, I, I have actually a, a few questions if you have some time left. Yes. Um, you, we haven't talked about generative models. Um, do, do, you, do you have any, any words about like how we can, for example, generate, I don't know, like new proteins for, uh, I don't know, uh, figuring out whether we can uh, find a cure for this COVID right now? Just, you know, actu actually, like, how do you say, current question for the current world. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so, yeah, the community is also working on the graph uh, generative uh, models. So you have two directions. The first direction, you can do it in a recursive way. So um, what you're going to do is that you are create, you know, your molecule atom after atom. Okay, so you, create, you, you start with an atom, then you have a candidate for the next atom and also uh, the next bound between the two atoms. And you can do that, you know, it's a kind of um, LSTM style. And the second direction is to do it, you know, in, uh, in one shot. So you need um, a network that can, um, that can um, uh, predict uh, what is the length or the size of your uh, of your molecule, and then uh, and then what are the connections? So you have these two directions. You can do it in a recursive way, or you can do it in one shot. So they are they are different. Um, so the community is more interesting in the recursive way today. Um, and I I have a paper on the one shot, and basically they are they are performing the same. I mean uh, it's uh, I don't I don't see uh, any any difference, um, but you can do it. Yeah. So the, the only thing is. How do you treat? Yeah, how, the question is your molecule can have different uh, size, uh, and this is the key. Um, this is the key. Uh, I would say the challenge here. So, um, how do you deal with different sizes? But we, we have different uh, options to do that. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, and also, I... one thing which is very interesting uh, related to the chemistry of that is that so graph. What I want to make is that graph neural network, in some sense, are too much flexible. Okay, so um, what you need, you, so when you go from, from the standard of net, um, so this, this as you know, the grid is very structured. Okay, so you, you can get a lot of information for the structure uh, of the grid, but you don't have this in graph. Again, you lose, you know, um, the, the node ordering and everything. Yeah. So we need to find a way to, you know, to have more and more structure inside the graph neural networks. One way to do that is uh, the architecture. So the architecture, for example, you would like to combine, uh, for example, if you do uh, chemistry, you would like to combine Schrodinger equation, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, Hamilton energy. So uh, people are, are doing that yes, uh, yes, to yes. constrain better, you know, your graph neural network. So again, graph neural network are in some sense, um, you know, too much flexible. You need to find a way to, uh, to add more, um, more universal, you know, constraints. Yeah, actually, about the universal constraints, I got here a question. Uh, what do you mean by universal learning capacity? Yeah, so this is the recent works on graph neural networks. So people are trained to, um, uh, in some sense, you're trying to classify your neural networks, right? There are many publications on neural networks. So how do you classify them? So you need to find mathematical properties, like, you know, isotropic properties, anisotropic properties. And more recently, uh, there are, uh, you know, theoretical work on, you know, uh, uh, isomorphism and uh, you know exp um, expressibility of graph neural network depending on some class of um, of uh, theoretical uh, graphs. Graphs are you know 
starting by earlier, like two, 200 years ago. So we, we know a lot about graphs and we want to uh, classify graphs according to some mathematical property. Mm -hmm. So this, this is what I was, I was trying to mention that um, uh, you, can you can design graph neural networks for some special mathematical properties. I see. Thank you. Um, guys, feel free to ask questions. You can also write to me uh, if you're too shy. I mean, I'm not shy. I can just read. Uh, I have a question and thank you so much for this great lecture. Uh, and you mentioned that you created like a benchmark data set uh, type of like, uh, so people can benchmark their different graph neural networks. Um, but I, I feel like a lot of those networks also learn some like representation in the graph and a lot of downstream tasks could be like an unsupervised setting where I think in the benchmarking data sets, you're all just using accuracy uh, more or less. So it's like you have labels, ground truth labels. So it's more in the supervised setting. So do you have any thoughts on how we could benchmark like the graph network's performance in an unsupervised setting or I don't know, like sem semi-supervised setting um, or like by measuring their performance in some common downstream tasks or application. Uh, I would like to hear your thoughts on it. Thank you. Yeah. So I think this is one of the most favorite uh, topics of Yann, uh, the self-supervised <laughs> learning. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, you, as you can tell, I, I brainwashed uh, the students in the class pretty well. <laughs> yes, yes, so that's why I'm asking. <laughs> no, of course, I mean, um, the, well, of course, one, one important question um, is, um, you you want to to learn efficiently right you don't mm -hmm. want to have too much labels to be able to uh, to predict well mm -hmm. so so self supervised learning um um is 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 one way to do that right you, mm -hmm. you want to um, and you can do that also with graph right you can you can hide some part of the information of your graph and then you can predict this hidden information to get mm -hmm. you know a representation so um I guess now it's hard for me to follow uh, the recent, uh, all the recent uh, GCN work, but I guess if you Google it, there will probably be already one or two papers on this, on this idea. I, mm -hmm. I mean, there is nothing special with uh, GCN. Mm -hmm. So you can mm -hmm. apply the same ideas like self-supervised learning to GCN. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. we, do, we, don't, we don't put that in the, in the benchmark yet. It's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So that's something maybe we, we, we could do. Mm -hmm. So actually, arguably, uh, all of self-supervised learning actually exploits some sort of graph structure, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, when you do self-supervised learning in text, for example, you take, you know, you take a sequence of words and you learn uh, you know, to predict uh, a word in the middle or missing words, whatever they are. Uh, there is a graph structure and that graph structure is uh, how many times a word appears uh, you know, some distance away from another word. So make, mm -hmm. um, you know, imagine you have all the words and then you, uh, you you say you know within this context you know make a graph between words. So this would be a very simplified version of it. But make a graph that indicates uh, how many times this word appears uh, at distance three from that uh, from that other word, right? Mm -hmm. Then you mm -hmm. have another graph for distance one, another one for distance two, etc. Right. So that constitutes a graph, and it's a graph that sort of indicates you know in what context two words uh, simultaneously appear. Um, you can think of um, uh, you know, a text that's, you know, basically a linear graph and, you know, the, the neighbors that you take uh, in a, you know, when you train a transformer, basically, you know, is taking a neighborhood in this graph, right? Mm -hmm. So um, when you do uh, metric learning, uh, the type uh, of stuff that Isha Mishra talked about, uh, you know, using uh, contrastive training where you have two samples that you know are similar and two samples you know are dissimilar, this mm -hmm. basically is a graph. It's a similarity graph that you're using. You're saying, you're telling the system, here are two samples that are linked uh, because I know they are similar. And here are two samples that I know are not linked because I know they're dissimilar. And I'm trying to find a graph embedding, essentially. You can think of those neural nets are learning a graph embedding uh, for nodes so that uh, nodes that are linked in the graph have similar vectors and nodes that are not are, have dissimilar vectors. So uh, mm -hmm. there is a very, very strong connection between self-supervised learning and uh, uh, you know, kind of the graph view of uh, of, uh, of a training set. I don't think it's been exploited or, or kind of realized uh, yet mm -hmm. by a lot of people. So there might be really interesting stuff to do there. I don't know what you think about this, Xavier, but... Uh, yeah, exactly. This is completely related to the... 
you know, on the, on the graph, you don't have any uh, node positioning. And mm -hmm. what you are saying, Jan, is exactly that. So how do we get, you know, a positioning between nodes that are relevant to your particular application? And, and, and you want to do it in a self-supervised way. Because, mm -hmm. because then you will learn, you know, all possible, uh, you know, configurations and you don't need to, to have labels to do that. So, yeah, this is the point. See, you will get, if you, if you know how to compare, you know, um, nodes. So, basically, how do you extract positional encoding? Then you, you will do a great job, you know. That's, 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 that's one of the most important uh, questions in, in graph neural networks and, and also for, for an LP and many other applications. Great. Thank you. Uh, a question just arrived here. Uh, so could you possibly highlight the most important parts of graph uh, with attention? I think we maybe have gone a little fast there and someone got a little bit lost. <laughs> yeah, so uh, graph attention uh, network. So the first uh, technique was um, developed by Joshua Benjo, Peter Vilachilvix. And uh, so it's probably, you know, the first work you, you, you would like to see. Um, but you can also do like, uh, you can take, you know, the transformer the standard transformer, and then you can make it, you know, a graph version. It's, it's, it's quite uh, straightforward to do it. Just by, multiplying the, just by multiplying with the agency, agency metrics, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, you can already do it, you know, with PyTorch transformer. So there is a mask. Uh, exactly, with a minus a infinity. Yeah, a mask, exactly. So if you put minus infinite with soft max, you will get zero. Exactly. So, so I think I'm going to so, show this tomorrow. So they are going yeah, to... Exactly. So you can already do graph, you know, transformer very easily with, uh, with PyTorch. Uh, but the thing is, it's, it's going to be a full matrix. Yeah. So, so it's going to take, a, it's, going to, it's going to use a lot of your GPU memory because there are many uh, values that you don't need. So, yes, so yes, if, yes. You, if you want to, to scale to larger graphs, then you need something that exploits the sparsity like DGL. Uh, or PyTorch geometric, for example. Yeah, so last week we coded by, uh, by from scratch. So we, we actually see all the operations inside. And then maybe we can just add one additional metrics there just to make like this uh, masked part such that we can retrieve the uh, graph convolutional net from the code that we already uh, have written. So that would Absolutely. be, I think, a connection for tomorrow. And uh, hold on, there are more questions coming. Uh, is there an, any application where uh, using ChebNet might be better than spatial, spatial GCN? Um, so, uh, uh, I would say they are part of the, you know, isotropic. Um, this is the class I, uh, yeah, this is the class what I call, you know, isotropic uh, GCN. So, um, uh, for me, I mean, I mean, of course, it will depend on your data and it will depend on your task. You know, if you have some task where your data is, uh, you know, isotropic, this kind of information, then ChemNet will do a very good job, uh, for sure. Now, if you have information where anisotropic is important, for example, for social networks, you don't want, you know, to treat people the same way, the, the same, uh, you don't want to treat the neighbors the same way, then uh, it's not going to do a good job. So it really depends on, on your task where isotropy is, is very important. If, you, if isotropy is very important, then you should use ChemNet because ChemNet, you know, is using um, all bit of information about your graph in an anisotropic way. Mm -hmm. And if you are using, you know, GCN, the vanilla GCN, you are just using, you know, the first two uh, terms of approximation of ChemNet. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, there we can learn the edges, right? We can learn the representation for the edges such that they discriminate between neighbors, right? No, 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 no. This is um, no. This that this, this one is anisotropic. Oh, okay, okay. You, you were talking about uh, isotropic. What I mean by isotropic is that if um, if you have a pure isotropic, you know, uh, graph problems, then you should use uh, ChebNet. ChebNet. Otherwise, but, yeah. But otherwise, yeah, it's better to use yeah. anisotropic uh, GCN. Of course. Um, more questions, guys? Um, really? um, hey, I have a question. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, a lot of these methods require a uh, existing adjacency matrix and for uh, some problems. For example, like you don't, you know that there is a graph structure, but you don't know the underlying connections. Do you know of any work that addresses this problem? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so far, most works uh, focus on having already, you know, the graph structure. And, and, and of course, uh, you would like sometimes, sometimes you just have data. Like for example, you know, you just have a, a, set, of, uh, a set of features and, and you want to learn, you know, some graph structure. It's very hard, very, very hard. <laughs> so um, there are some works, you know, uh, doing that. 
so they are trying to learn some some graph structure, and at the same time they are trying to learn you know node representation. Uh, so that's that's promising. That that's, that's interesting, and this is also some some work that that I'm trying to do now. But I can tell you, it's, it's very hard to do, and especially because um, if you if you if you let you know the adjacency matrix to be a variable, then you are n square. Okay, you have n square uh, unknown parameters to learn. So, um, so it's uh, it's not easy. Um, but yeah, this is a. So, I would say that these techniques. Um, there are many natural data uh, coming with graphs. Okay, you don't need to build any graphs, and this is already giving you you know a lot of uh, of good tools. Now, if you can give me maybe what you have in mind. What kind of application you have in mind? While you want to use, you know, when you want to learn graphs, uh, at the same time, um, maybe we can talk so, about it. So I can tell you, Xavier. Of course, uh, Zeming, uh, you know, will will correct me, but uh, Zeming is actually uh, working on uh, predicting uh, protein function predict, uh, you know, protein function prediction basically, and and so the underlying graph would be the, for example, the contact map or the the kind of proximity graph of different sites on a protein, and you don't have that. I mean. In most cases, you don't. You, that's that's no. kind of what the things you you have to predict. So you could view this as some sort of latent, you know, graph variable. I see. For your model. Ziming, uh, maybe you had some other idea in in mind. Yeah, I, I think actually. So the more specific problem is that uh, some of these graphs, you know, the edges, and you uh, you know some of the edges, but you don't know the other ones. For example, in protein function prediction, and um, you can imagine like two proteins that have. Um, similar functions as having an edge between them, um, but they might not have the same function. So you don't know sort of the edge weights and you kind of have like a, a human labels that are inaccurate. So uh, you know that they're connected in some way, but you don't know the edge weights and you know that there are other proteins that should be connected, but you don't have labels for. So I guess this is more of a graph completion problem. Where yeah, and, but, and this one is easy. <laughs> this one, if, if you have, it's like the semi, you know, the semi uh, graph clustering problem. So if you already have some labels, just a few labels, and you have some structure around this, that's something you can you can live with. Uh, if you have absolutely no structure on the edge, and then you need to learn the graph, that is very hard. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hey, I have a question about. Uh, uh, splits of the data when you're actually training a graph neural network um, because it's uh, like can you talk about some of the things that you would want to consider um, when actually splitting the data into say training and validation um, like you might want to have uh, all of the nodes in the training data for it to actually be exposed to everything that's um, in 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 the in in the graph data um, and you might have a case where different types of edges are in balance in the data set. Um, can you talk about like, when that would be important? What are some of the considerations in splitting the data when you're training? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. So you are talking about uh, unbalanced training set? Uh, yes, and also like, so if you have like a huge relational uh, data set, right? Um, you, oh, can okay. you talk about some of the considerations for uh, for splitting the data when you're trying to train a graph network? So for um, relational data, data sets, um, so you may have, you know, uh, millions of small graphs, and it is fine, I mean, because this graph neural network, they are independent of the size of your graph. So uh, so this is this is not issue to learn some uh, good uh, graph learning representation. There is no issue with that. Now, if you have unbalanced data set, um, I don't know, um, so that's maybe you can maybe apply some standard techniques to uh, to do that. So uh, you can also you know for cross entropy for example you can you can weight your cross entropy depending on the size of each class. So that may be something you can do. Uh, yeah, but I, ne I never you know uh, thought too much about this. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? I'm still getting things written here, but you can oh. voice yourself if you are. Yeah, uh, I have a question actually. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the lecture at this time, especially for you. Uh, mm -hmm. So how do you deal with cases where the nodes do not have the same dimension? Like if I want to run a small, simple vanilla graph convolutional network, but my nodes are something like even for Facebook, 
people and then pages and i want different dimension so how do you think about graph like very a very simple graph neural network in that uh i don't think it has nothing to do with graph neural networks if you have different dimensions for your vector so probably you need to 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 put everything on the same dimension and then you need to use some indicator function Uh, like one when you have the information and zero when you don't have any information. And this will be used during the computation of the loss. And then when you back propagate, you, if, you, if you don't have any feature information, you will not use it. But I, I don't think it has anything to do with graph neural network. Okay, thank you. Hold on, you're writing, <laughs> I'm reading <laughs> so much. Hmm. So uh, maybe I, I don't understand the question, but I will read it uh, out loud anyway. Uh, is there any GCN which can work on multiple ag agency uh, matrices together? For example, a bidirectional graph. I don't know what this means. <laughs> Uh, so if the question is about hypergraph, so you know you may have more than one edge uh, connecting uh, your nodes, yes, there are some work uh, about this. It's an extension, it's a natural extension mathematically. Uh -huh. So uh, you can, yeah, you can do that. There is, a, there is no limitation to go to hypergraph. It's fine. And there are now some uh, um, data sets for this, uh, for this task. So um, if there is a, uh, an application, Uh, uh, so students uh, would be interesting to do. Yeah, it's, there is already data set and papers about this. Okay. Uh, another question would be, does it make sense to have nodes that are features of a person and do graph classification or have nodes as person and do uh, node classification? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, so uh, often, you know, people ask me the question, uh, can I do a graph given this data? So it's really task dependent. I think it's really, you know, when, when it's going to be useful or not, when you get, you know, some good relationships. Uh, because what is a graph, you know, it's just a collection of pairwise, you know, uh, of pairwise connections. So that's it. So the question is when, when it is uh, relevant to solve your task. Sometimes it's, it is relevant, sometimes it's not. So it really depends on the, on the yeah, it's obvious, but it really depends on the data and the, and the task you want to solve. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the student is satisfied with your answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think we run out of questions, unless there are more coming my way. Uh, no? It's, it starts getting bright outside there. Yeah, exactly, like exactly. I was noticed, yeah. <laughs> the sun is rising. <laughs> uh, that's nice. Okay, I think that was it. Uh, thank, thank you so, so much. It was like... I mean, really, those were so pretty. Uh, these slides were so pretty. I, I, I had to learn so much from <laughs> the way yeah. you teach as well. Um, yeah, yeah, really, thank you again uh, for waking up so early. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think this is a fascinating topic. You know, as, as you know, I've been uh, involved in this at the beginning. Yes. And uh, I think it opens a completely new door to applications of machine learning and neural nets. Uh, you know, it's a new world. It's a completely different world. Um, I know your PhD advisor had been working on, you know, graph uh, signal processing for a long time. So this was kind of a natural transition for, for him and for you, I guess. But, um, exactly. uh, I, you know, I, I, I think we haven't seen the, the end of this. We'll, we'll, uh, we're going to be surprised by what's going to come out of this. I mean, there's really already sort of fascinating work uh, in that area in high energy physics, in computational chemistry, in, uh, you know, social uh, uh, network uh, applications. And uh, you, you kind of cited all the big names in the, you know, if you are interested in this topic, if you're listening to this, uh, Yuri Leskovic is, is, is one of the big names, you know, in addition to Xavier, obviously, but, um, and uh, Joanne Brunat, whom you know, because he's a professor here and he talks about it in, in, this, in this course. Uh, Michael Bronstein uh, is also a big contributor. He's made some really interesting, uh, Uh, contributions to the to the topic, also on sort of slightly different methods than the one uh, that, you, that you talked about today, uh, on like you know, uh, like you know, using graph uh, neural nets for like 3D meshes and uh, for computer uh, graphics and things like that. So, 
Um, I agree. I think, I, th I think which is, this is also a field, you know, where um, there is a back and forth between, you know, uh, mathematics and also applications. Yeah. So if you look at, for example, this protein stuff, it's very, very hard. But uh, at the same time, so we can learn a lot, you know, from the mathematical side. We can, we can, and it's very exciting, right? Because you, you want both. If you want to be able to make a scientific uh, discovery, you need to be, you know, um, uh, driven by some real world, very hard problem. And then at the same time, you have these new tools, you know, coming up with uh, graph theory, uh, neural networks. And, and it's a way also for us to better understand, you know, why neural networks work so well. And, and, uh, and this is, you know, um, a direction where it, it looks like, you know, each day they are like a new problem in this, in this direction. So the pie is big. And for everyone, for, for the young students to come and uh, to, uh, to enjoy, you know, this, uh, this, this area of research. Great. Well, thank you again and uh, enjoy your day. Yeah, thanks <laughs> again. <really. laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Guys, see you tomorrow. <laughs>